Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Rich Schwartz, and I'm from the medical school and professor there and a uh, pulmonary and critical care doctor, but spent a great deal of time doing teaching and part of the new curriculum we had there and just started two years ago. Uh, and then something called the Academy, which is kind of like a black center for the med school for about nine years. Uh, in this session, hopefully you're in the right place about advancing and promoting teaching. Uh, and there's really uh, two pieces to this session uh, to provide some insights on how we support faculty to be better teachers. And that'll be the, I'm going to do a quick overview of that in the next 10 minutes. And then uh, Julia Lee, who's from uh, School of Engineering, is going to talk briefly about how we provide faculty incentives. Uh, to improve teaching. And if you were in one of the last sessions, this notion of uh, misalignment of incentives is a potential problem for organizations in general, and schools perhaps in particular, when there's the needs of the students, the needs of the faculty, the needs of the organization, and how to get those aligned is, is an ongoing challenge. Um, so, Rich, before you get going, uh, just to kind of how we're going to run this session, uh, 10 minutes of um, presentation for Rich and Julia and a few minutes of just clarifying questions before we get to a group activity um, at the end. And you're going to have a chance to weigh in on the things you've heard and other things that you are thinking about in your own schools and, uh, and we'll go from there in terms of discussion. So improving teaching, uh, you know, there's sort of two approaches sometimes, the fortune cookie approach, you know, the, Teachers' work makes the curriculum much better. It's sort of it's all about the interpersonal aspects of it, and, uh, and that's important, but it's probably not the whole thing. And then there's the other side, you know, I will adopt best practices, which we've been trying to do for however many years. Hope has been in existence now, uh, and talk about that on and on and over and over again. And I think it's a blending of, of these two things in some ways, the art and science, it's focusing on the science uh, today. So I want to talk about how we can get better and the role of peer observation as part of that process. So this is from some work of uh, Anders Ericsson, uh, some of whom you may know, a psychologist uh, originally from Sweden and had most of his career in the US. And he talked about looking at something he calls deliberative practice, some people call it guided mastery, and this notion that just because you do something for a long time, doesn't mean you get better at it, right? That you need to reflect, you need to have other people helping you uh, to do better. Uh, and he's done this work with everything from chess players to radiologists looking at the same thing. And talks about this notion that as we get better, we can plateau at a number of different levels depending on whether we continue to do that reflection and get feedback and act on the feedback and so forth. And even though these everyday skills become very uh, automatic, and we sort of like that sometimes, we don't have to think about what we do, it's just kind of built in, it's happened and so forth, that doesn't allow us to continue to get better and improve because of this arrested development stage and then ultimately uh, ideally up to expert performance if you in fact continue to reflect and get feedback and work on it. So there's a lot of stuff going on, uh, I think, in education generally right now, but very much certainly at the medical school, about the role of coaching. And we probably, you know, coaching <coughs> brings to mind many images. Uh, there are a lot of personal coaches uh, that help individuals in terms of work-life balance and figuring out how to navigate their careers and those kinds of things. And of course, most of us had experience with athletic coaches at some point in our lives. You know, and what is a coach? Well, it's usually a close personal relationship with an individual, and that person has the freedom to really observe you, uh, make uh, comments about things that you could do better, and then you work on that, and you get observed again, and that's again how you get up to that expert performance, kind of with that guided mastery uh, notion. And so what we've tried to do is blend this idea of coaching with uh, a peer observation uh, program. So this notion is that teachers like you will come and work with you, watch you, and give you feedback on things that you're doing quite well and on things that maybe you could do a little bit better. And so this is a list of the sorts of things that are built into this notion of peer observation. Now, it sometimes feels like you're under the magnifying glass. And when we first talk about that with people, is 
you know, a little bit of, I'm not so sure, I really want somebody in my classroom watching what I do, what is that going to feel like? But the reality is people can get used to this and wind up finding that it's very helpful, uh, whether it's about looking at specific pedagogical approaches. Uh, in fact, practice giving feedback to each other is good because it helps you to give feedback to your learners, which is a challenge for a lot of uh, our faculty. <coughs> Uh, allows us to document our teaching activities better and so forth, all these things that you see here. And the reality is we think everyone can learn to become an effective peer observer. Now doing this often depends on developing uh, these skills in a formal way. And I'll tell you how long we've been doing this. This is from a symposium we ran at our academy at the med school in 2011. So we've been talking about this for a while. We've had an interest group of faculty who've been working on this. We've done research on some of the ways of thinking about and doing peer observation as well. And it has taken us seven months, we implemented a year ago, so six, seven years to really get the program formally up and running. So it does take time to, to get into this, but I think it can be very helpful. Uh, our new curriculum is based on something called case-based collaborative learning. Uh, and so this new format, which is a blend of team-based learning, case-based learning, a little bit of problem-based learning, kind of all rolled into one in a, in a fusion for the medical school, uh, has specific elements about how you do it well. So we had a group that got together and said, what are the key parts of teaching in this new format? <coughs> and we've actually published as well the same kind of thing for lecturing a few years ago that we've also used for peer observation. So starting out with an instrument, and I think we've handed out uh, one of the papers that has an instrument embedded in it, uh, starting out with an instrument is really helpful because that instrument helps you to think about your teaching, just looking at the instrument, uh, and it helps you make more objective observations of what you're looking at. Uh, so it's very helpful. When we started talking about peer observation and doing this with our faculty, it was actually quite well received in terms of using this worksheet. Uh, it was, you know, most people, 73%, thought it was extremely helpful or helpful in identifying uh, and discussing new teaching techniques. So again, this is, even after we had done faculty development for this process, the peer observation enhanced the faculty development that we did for teaching in this new format. And 90% found, you can see, that the observation debriefing was either helpful or extremely helpful. So this notion, again, that I'm now getting feedback that's actionable, that's tied to these specific elements that we think are important for the <coughs> teaching, uh, turn out to be very productive. In, in terms of setting this up, there are different models. Uh, this peer review model, uh, which is kind of what the observation that I've been describing is about. It's a discussion about teaching, mutual reflection, and frankly, having been the observed and the observer, you learn a lot often by being the observer. Wow, that was a great thing that that person just did. I'll incorporate that into my teaching as well. So it isn't just the person who's providing the initial feedback who benefits from this. And at this point, it's viewed as purely formative. This is just about helping you to become better. And this developmental model in terms of competencies, again, if you have a more formal instrument and talk about the elements of competence that you want your teacher to develop, you can do that as well. And then the last one is the evaluation model. This is one we haven't really implemented yet, but we are talking about it. So as we think about aligning those incentives, how do we potentially even promote, reward, otherwise incentivize people who make education a focal point of their career in the university? This may be a way to do that. Because you say, well, I'm a good teacher. Well, how do I know? If you're on a promotion board, you're a, developmental, a departmental committee, how do I know you're a good teacher? We say, well, my students like me. And that's always been brought up as a suspicious thing, right? Of the students, what are they really evaluating when they say that you're a good teacher? So this is a more objective way. We train our observers sufficiently that we feel like there's inter-rater reliability. They're using a valid instrument that we could potentially use this down the road uh, to help people uh, get rewarded for their teaching. And we're not at that level yet, but, but we're building potentially up to that. Uh, implementation for this. So quickly, as I summarize, we all can be better as teachers. I think whatever level you're at, we all can get better. But without this deliberative practice, we're likely, in fact, not just to plateau, but to get worse. One of the 
famous sayings in K-12 education is, have you taught for 30 years or did you teach one year 30 times? Right? Have you made any changes uh, to the way that you practice, if you will, in terms of your teaching? Uh, and peer observation, uh, not only is a way to improve your teaching, but frankly, the interactions with your colleagues is a, is a very rewarding thing to engage in as well. And again, can be used for either formative or summative assessment. All right, so again, just a brief overview of this part of what we hope to deal with today. Let me bring up Julia's uh, presentation. I'll we'll have her go through this quickly as well, and then, um, sorry. Rich, do you want to answer any clarifying questions? I didn't know you wanted to do that after both, or we can do it now. Just if there are clarifying okay. questions now, and, and, then, um, and then we can have Questions about anything that I've done that was this overview. Uh, how many faculty have been observed or observe, observers? Uh, how many faculty? Now, Barbara, what's the number that you're up to at this point? Uh, this is Barbara Cockrell, who's uh, Director of Faculty Development at the uh, Med School. We've, hit, we've done this in the, the pre-clerkship uh, curriculum, so it's a classroom teaching, and I think we're up to about 45 um, people, and the, the peer coaches, we're sticking with the coaching model to start with, yeah. um, we have uh, 12. And we do this informally in the clinical arena in different departments, but the real organized focus has been on this pre clerkship curriculum. Other questions? Other clarifying questions? Yes. Just since you've trotted the numbers out now, can you give us some sense of the proportions or percentages? Denominator? Yes. Oh, yes. Sounds um, small to me. It is small. Well, we, uh, we have. It's not as small as you might think. We, for our first year, we have six classroom courses in the first year, and so every student has to take every course. So the entire eight, class is doing faculty. in each. Um, each of the so it's there. probably about forty percent. Of that first year, of the first year yeah. faculty, because yeah. you have that ability to focus yeah. in. Yeah. Right. Okay. And it's all been completely volunteer. I mean, people are signing up for it. And it's, well, no, no, it's totally, it teasing. is totally yeah. volunteer. And that's been one of the challenges is to get people to understand that it really just is coaching yeah. and not evaluative. Yeah. Okay, so Julia, let me take it from here. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna pan out a bit and, and talk about, um, give you a brief overview on the um, motivation uh, design process and usage cases in the recent publication of Career Framework uh, for Advancing University Teaching. Um, I was actually part of this working group. It's, it's really the publication is the culmination of a three and a half year uh, global um, effort um, to develop a uh, open access uh, tool for people to assess, evaluate, uh, reward uh, teaching achievement. And really, I want to use this platform as well uh, to hopefully spark some conversation about whether or not this is actually relevant for Harvard or different cohorts in Harvard who we're actually depending on for um, teaching. So this um, Slide is meant to hopefully impress upon you the rigor with which this um, study was actually done. So it's led by uh, Dr. Ruth Graham, who is actually a professor at Imperial College of Mechanical uh, Engineering and, and has since become a consultant. But the, the initial draft of the framework was done, was uh, informed uh, by pedagogy literature uh, and education literature. And then it was sent out for feedback from experts uh, to uh, and university leadership across multiple institutions and disciplines, and I wrote including medicine because even though it's a, a Royal Academy of Engineering publication, is really meant to be broadly applicable. And what's I think uh, more powerful um, is the fact that it was piloted across about five different continents in all the schools that are actually listed here. So the schools that are actually listed, institutions that are listed in parentheses are the ones that uh, gave feedback as opposed to direct piloting, but nevertheless, um, these were who were uh, involved in providing um, the, the, the final product that was published. Um, I was involved in two ways. Uh, since I was ready on the committee, I had gotten the, the blessing, as it were, from um, our then uh, FAS Dean Mike Smith, and then also C's Dean uh, Doyle, to actually really uh, think about this framework and give feedback 
in the context of how I was thinking about it, and in particular in the context of how do we support non-faculty, uh, non-ladder faculty uh, careers who were actually depending on more and more for, for the teaching. Um, and then also directly um, for University of South America, where as part of the senior leadership and as part of that effort, we were really redefining um, the, the structure of the university and we used this framework, uh, in fact, to inform on a, a dual um, promotion track for the faculty there for a teaching and research base or some combination of both. So that's the context. Um, and, and certainly there was a lot of emerging trends for the motivation for developing this framework, uh, certainly in um, uh, Europe and Asia and elsewhere that, that you know, as, as fees were actually um, increasing for universities, whereas they used to be free, there's more and more demands now because they have to pay uh, for better teaching, right? And then I think we, we've, uh, there was some discussion about this, this this morning that there's also this competition for online uh, learning resources as well. Interestingly, also in uh, Europe uh, and also Asia, uh, the governments are actually linking studentships and fee structures to quality of teaching. So there is actually some linkage to that that is actually um, it, um, encouraging people to make the change, uh, encouraging strongly. And, and certainly, uh, I think last but not least, is that there was recognition amongst the working group uh, and external to it that, you know, that even though there's this increased rhetoric, uh, for lack of a better word, for better teaching amongst the faculty, there was really little incentive for really improving it because, as, you know, as long as you actually pass some kind of baseline uh, teaching um, quality, then beyond that, your promotion chances are really tied to research output. And what this framework was trying to do was is to try to provide a useful metric for evaluating teaching achievement that overcomes kind of traditional barriers uh, in terms of not having necessarily well-defined um, things for these different levels. And what is, is particularly interesting is that it ties the success of levels of uh, promotion, if you will, uh, to the, your sphere of impact. And, and then what the framework also provides is uh, examples of evidence for what those um, might look like. So just briefly to show this, you know, one can imagine that kind of at the most basic baseline level that, you know, your, your effective teacher and your sphere of impact is going to be the students. You're actually thinking conscientiously about how do uh, students learn and how to effectively teach. If you wanted to go up to the next level, then that sphere of impact that actually has to extend to maybe uh, relevance to the broader uh, institutional context or that you're actually giving mentorship to your uh, colleagues. For the third track, uh, as we're moving up, we decided that we we're going to split this into two different ways. One is if you continue to improve uh, your, the practice of teaching and the sphere of impact to extend you know, to a larger cohort and beyond the university, but it also allows for people who want to do scholarly research to also advance in this way if they're kind of doing research on pedagogy um, and, and, and other uh, similar things. And then, and then of course, you know, um, and then of course the, the highest level. And so obviously you're not meant to read all this. We, if for anybody interested, I have the actual publication that goes into the details. Um, but really it's, it's broadly, you know, the, one of the key things was giving examples based on all these piloted schools of what that might mean for the different levels. And these levels can be broadly um, separated into two major, I think, categories. <coughs> one is the approach, which is really, it, it's due to the instructor himself, right? Some, some uh, self-introspection about your teaching as well as your professional activities. The other is the impact part, is, is, um, which is assessed through both direct and indirect uh, measures of student learning, as well as kind of uh, you know, what your peers think about your teaching, um, to, for example, Richard's point. And so just an example, this is just, there was a number of universities that have actually used this framework in different ways to kind of put it into the context of how it might work in the particular university, whether it's a slice through this in different ways, or whether as a metric for kind of, you know, where you want to be in terms of uh, assessing the different people. So here, for example, this is University of Twente in the Netherlands, as we say. Uh, this, this one shows that, you know, so for somebody who chooses to have most of their 
a career in an education track, there is a baseline requirement for research, um, but at the same time, most of the promotion is really going to be tracked to their teaching, right? And what's very useful and interesting about this framework is that, in fact, um, this institution has also tied the support structure for helping these people move up um, to, to the different levels as well. And certainly, you know, I list this as the Netherlands, but in fact, the University College London one look also very much like this. So there's a lot of universities that actually try to use this framework to kind of make changes to their own institutions. Um, and as I said, the governments have really gotten involved. So for example, in Malaysia, um, you know, there was a national government call that universities had to develop some kind of unified academic uh, pathway. And so a number of the universities uh, have been using this framework to, to try to work that out collectively. What's really amazing is that as a whole, the Dutch government and, and most of the Dutch, some large fraction of Dutch universities have really kind of embraced this to the extent that the Minister of Education, who um, actually was on this committee before he became Minister of Education, has, devi has decided to actually put uh, money towards this grant to say, we want better teaching, so I'm going to invest in better teaching. And so, with the, and, and so they've actually mapped these different levels that people can uh, apply for and get recognized for to these different tracks of this uh, framework. And in the initial um, run of this in 2017, you'll notice that they actually invested 6 million euros into this. And this, these are the number of fellows uh, at the different levels that are being supported now to actually improve their uh, teaching. And so, you know, this, this was published formally in April 2018, as, um, that we know of some 30 plus universities that we know of actually use this to inform or enact changes in way in their university. So there is this global trend towards really recognizing teaching more. And then I want to kind of bring us back to Harvard with, with that particular uh, context is can we use this framework to incentivize our latter faculty to be better teachers in some ways and to support. But more importantly, um, something that I've been thinking about is, you know, can we actually better support the non-ladder faculty who we're actually depending more and more on um, for our teaching purposes? So if you actually look at these numbers, they make up a pretty large fraction of the faculty that we're depending on. Um, and so if I were just to just, uh, this is obviously not correct, but if I were just to, you know, map that to, attempt to map that to this particular framework, you know, this might be the level of where we would actually place them. But as I was, you know, interviewing different people in different departments, I realized that, you know, the, what, what the expectations of these different people are very different um, based on what departments they are at. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. So, so really my question to you is, you know, is a modified framework relevant for Harvard? Is it useful to support uh, non-ladder careers uh, um, or as a means to reward um, uh, teaching for ladder faculty? And, and then how do we actually support and incentivize? Um, and then of course the goals today is, is really, I think we want to ask the question is how do we support all faculty to be better teachers here? We're going to break out into groups and discuss this and then also how do we incentivize uh, this improvement in teaching? And uh, I'll, I'll just leave that up about next steps um, in, in this um, study, but um, I'll, I'll just leave it up if, uh, for, during the question session. Clarifying questions for Julia about the framework? I just have one question. Uh, did you put any, uh, did the committee um, try to look at sort of dollars at all? And you know, you hear all the time like, well, research faculty bring in overhead from grants, teaching faculty, you know, if you have these teaching faculty, they don't bring in dollars, of course. You know, they might bring in tuition, right? Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you looked at money at all. Uh, not <clears throat> as a direct con consequence of what we wrote, but I, I think money was <laughs> talked about indirectly in that a lot of universities actually do depend on student fees. Uh, so in that case, this is where I was saying that as student fees are going up, there was a demand for better teaching. Um, and so I, I think really in that particular sense, but we, I think it was more that we recognized that you know, better teaching was a need and that there was no support for it. 
what universities, a lot of the universities have done is actually invested their own dollars in supporting this, right? So if the university said this is an important thing, we're going to invest in it. You know, the problem is that oftentimes is we're, this is an important thing, just do it along with everything else and whatever, right? So I think that was, that, that was something that we were really conscientious of. And a lot of universities who, who did this really did invest. In. So I just have a question, and this is off the base of having taught in Europe for a while, as well as having worked here. Um, I'm wondering if you've seen any differentials in terms of kind of national culture with regards to how quickly universities and systems are picking this up. For example, the Netherlands for a long time was way ahead of the rest of Europe in terms of like emphasis on teaching, emphasis on experiential learning, active learning. Um, and because they're national systems as well, they're primarily public systems versus the US's privatized system. Right. Have you seen any differences in terms of how large institutions like governments in the Netherlands or the EU versus other systems like the US are supporting it, and how is that affecting adoption? <laughs> so I think with the Netherlands, I mean, it's, it's really amazing because they decided to take this, I mean, to, to begin with, uh, all faculty at universities in the Netherlands actually have to have some kind of teaching certification, so they already have to go through that training. So it wasn't that much of a jump to kind of do that, right? Uh, but but um, in, in terms of other institutions, so for example, you know, Cambridge, Oxford, I was just there, you know, they were kind of resistant, they're kind of, you know, like us, but, <laughs> but in, that, in that sense, you know, the fact that now the UK government are saying, okay, you're going to get a gold star, silver star, or bronze star. And what star you get is going to affect what students come. And you can argue like, okay, well, you know, Cambridge, Oxford, it doesn't really matter because people want those. But the thing is, is that what they've also done is tied it to how much you can raise fees, or whether even you can raise fees, or whether the government will give you any kind of studentships as, as well. So they're that, that's how they're actually really kind of forcing forcing the change. Sounds like one more clarifying question. Um, so, oh, you know, it's not a clarifying question. So I'll, I'll, I'll defer. We'll come back to yes. the well, My just sort of clarify. Uh, was there a standard way that effective teaching was measured, or is there a recommendation? I think effective. So we, we gave lots of um, different examples as we were about taught. But I think that that is a that is something kind of to be continued, right? As in kind of. How do we, how do we, is effective, how do you say, okay, we're measuring effective teaching when we don't necessarily know how to right, assess um, student learning outcomes, for example. So it's not, it's not meant, it's meant to be a start. So I think different institutions have their own definition of what effective teaching is at the different levels. So it's, it's left for those institutions to decide, but we, we kind of set very broad guiding principles on, you know, this is where you might be thinking at at this level. We're moving on to the, the workshop. Uh, so what, what we wanted, as I was saying, in terms of the um, these these particular questions, is right to get a better understanding of, of you know the, the interest in supporting or incentivizing faculty here at Harvard. Um, we're going to split the room basically in half and um, have you work in, in groups to really kind of answer some of these questions. Uh, one, one group, one part of the room is really going to really look at how do we actually help faculty, whereas the other part of the group is going to look more at you know, how would we incentivize uh, faculty to be better, better teachers. So uh, we're going to talk in our tables for until uh, 12.55. And then we're going to ask for one or two insights, right, from each of the tables, but only one or two. So you'll have to figure out how to, which are the most important one or two um, things that will get reported out, and we'll then discuss as a, as a group. And we're going to be floating around, eavesdropping on the discussion, so we can see if we can pick up some themes. That I don't think any questions are. So we'll start with uh, which side should we start with? The helping or incentivizing? You guys had a great conversation. Can I start with you? Sure. Okay. So what top two <coughs> points that you thought were relevant? Um, so we were very interested in the issue of both non-ladder and ladder uh, communities. 
they're both very, very important. And so in terms of incentivizing, we think for non-ladder, the potential for retention and job security, we're losing too many people who are very, very good at teaching uh, because there is a ceiling to the uh, opportunities here. Um, in terms of ladder faculty, a couple of big uh, issues and also places to incentivize are around the issue of time, uh, mismatched objectives, right? The emphasis on research rather than on teaching. Um, so course releases, creating communities of practice, uh, that these might be some ways in which to uh, incentivize the latter faculty. Um, in, and then we also thought in terms of the faculty activity reports, um, that if you worked in more questions about teaching, and not just in terms of individual practice, but also working in communities, so peer observation, um, communities of practice, that these might begin to become things that would be evaluated in terms of pay raises. <coughs> Thank you. So I think what we'll do then is, if, you, if these were some of your ideas, try to go down your list and uh, come up with ideas that aren't on this list. <laughs> Okay, we had a kind of a ranging discussion on the fly. It's not as well organized as that. <laughs> a couple of specific things that we talked about that seemed both like helps and incentives, or maybe the first is an incentive, is the concept of a service score for ladder faculty that better incorporates their non-research activities as part of the um, promotion package. Um, and then something else that we talked about was something that uh, is similar to the curriculum fellow model at the medical school, the idea of having um, subject experts who are also expert in teaching uh, to work with faculty to relieve some of the burden of teaching well and to make the teaching of the, uh, um, to make teaching well easier and to uh, provide a good opportunity for people who want to teach to do that professionally. And we also talked about how there's a ceiling on that, and that's a problem. Great ideas from both tables. We're still on incentives over here. So, okay. Okay. I am so. Apparently the um, so a lot of the same things that other folks have already talked about. And you know, we also had a wide-ranging discussion and talked a lot about the tenure promotion um, issues at large uh, that drive this. But I think to add something Another idea that, again, really requires institutional level commitment is to rethink teaching as being the sole responsibility of an individual faculty member and think about teaching as the mission of the university, of the school, of the department, and think about restructuring teaching so that the default is teaching teams that include specialists with a variety of areas that include the faculty member as a subject matter expert, but other people, to, to take the time pressure and just to, to redistribute what teaching is. Thank you. So I, I just want to um, want to say it's sort of expanding on the ceiling, the ceiling conversation. And uh, in terms of number one, uh, what would be useful in providing faculty with incentives? Uh, we thought expanding the definition of success and just just taking it at that level and saying you know how how faculty perceive success. How can we expand as an institution to make them see the value of, of learning how to be a better teacher? And then uh, we also start number th uh, from number three, what promising practices do we see? Um, you know, we talked about all how the schools are all sort of bubbling up, the academy being one of them, um, where the schools are really creating some promising opportunities and centers for where you can actually learn to teach better. And that's a, a promising practice we think that other schools can learn from and continue to build on. <coughs> Thank you. Are you. Were you incented? Yes, we were also incented. Uh, sure. So one uh, one idea that that came up that we endorsed was trying to make um, trying to make faculty course websites and course videos available to colleagues mm -hmm. as the norm. And so if you wanted to take a look at what someone else was doing, and it would be easy to see their syllabus, their, all of their course materials, all of their lecture videos, and just create a culture where, a culture of transparency around teaching, um, where 
you know, <coughs> that all of our scholarly activities are done very much in the public, that our teaching activities electronically can be made public in a way that, that could, could change the culture. Right, so widely sharing. Uh, are there any other thoughts that we didn't come up with here from these other groups on incentives before we move on to helping? All right, let's move on to... So Can I say one other incentive that I chatted about with a few tables? It's fun to teach well. Mm -hmm. I mean, Carver will tell you that one of the biggest things that we found in recruiting faculty to do this stuff in our new curriculum was everybody said, you know, I've lectured, I've taught in this. This is the most fun I've ever had as a teacher. It doesn't always have to be about money. It does not, you know, and so I just wanted to throw that out there. And I think the, com the community that we have in our new curriculum is, is an incentive. It's not a monetary incentive, but pointing that out to other faculty, which brings to your point of sharing and uh, working together with other, other faculty. Okay, let's move on to helping. We're staying on time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we also had a very wide-ranging conversation that I think moved between incentivizing and helping, but where we landed was really on supports, and this almost goes to transparency, um, making supports for teaching truly visible across all the different levels of the institution, um, and making modeling, the use of those supports, um, making that visible from day one, and the example we used was um, at the Kennedy School, we have a new faculty institute. Before faculty even start day zero, um, they are they see they watch established faculty, their peers, their soon to be peers, modeling innovative and interesting teaching, um, and that begins a cohort effect, and it begins a conversation that is helpful because it it demystifies some of the practice of teaching, some of the experimentation. Um, and it also creates more of kind of, I think it was to Chris's group's point, it, it creates a bit of a um, kind of teaching as a communal, um, as a communal idea. And something, it shows that teaching is of value to the community. Great. How about you? How did you decide to help your teachers? Was this the group that couldn't answer your quite all the questions? <laughs> 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 Um, so we agree with a lot of what people have said, um, also focusing on sort of a centralized or, or kind of collecting the uh, community of knowledge that's here. There's a lot of individual programs with different departments, there's the Bach Center, all the schools have separate um, programs to help their teachers, uh, but pooling those resources, I admittedly have not looked at the New Health website, so. You should look, because they are all <coughs> It, it literally took years, and it's imperfect, but it is all there, I think. I mean, hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds, and hundreds of entries that are the organizations and the tools. And maybe to that point, um, making help more broadly known at Harvard. Um, <laughs> yeah. Claudia was saying that how many, like, what percentage of the attendees here are students versus how many of the attendees here are faculty? And I, I know that none of the faculty that I work with, of the hundred or so faculty that I know in, in, in Longwood, none of them are here. And so making these resources more widely known, um, including them. So creating that communication, it's not easy. And it seems like electronically, we have to be, all become more facile because I know for us at the med school, at the clinical part of the med school, that feels like the only way we can reach the 12,000 faculty that are all at all the different hospitals. <laughs> Was there another one? Well, I think, I think a lot of people mentioned a lot of things here, but I just did want to say that I think we were thinking that sometimes having um, champions within the staff or faculty to disseminate this kind of information is also important. And then another thing is uh, creating some school-based databases of all the available resources within the school, whether that be different room locations or technologies or even people, so that it's easy for staff or faculty to just access that and know for content and to reach 
And I think having those teams, um, as that group had brought up, with like instructional designers and all that dedicated towards you is a great resource. How about this? Thank you. So I think we um, we started off by just kind of comparing and, and sharing how our um, different institutions um, approach supporting faculty and um, teaching assistants and really folks at all levels. And I think much of what's been said here is what we've discussed, but really thinking about support in a very systematic way from you know starting with onboarding, with mentoring, um, with peer observation, with evaluation. Um, I think for me, the a, a big piece of that is also the culture, the culture and the emphasis on the importance of teaching um, and how do we make it more visible. Um, so I think it, it is really a lot of what everybody has said has been captured here and, and then the alignment of that with the incentives um, and really making sure that they're aligned and that there aren't perverse incentives kind of um, throwing off the, the purpose of making teaching a, a focus of the institution as well. And I think we have one more table. I saved you for last. <laughs> Okay, so we may prove to be the rebel table, but <laughs> um, I'm going to start with item five, um, because what we talked about is that the assumption that there's a need to improve teaching may be problematic for some. Some may not see it. And so in some ways, mobilizing at a grassroots level to start to engage everyone in even why that may be a goal. Um, otherwise, we're walking in with a lot of assumptions that create problems. Um, and it, it's troublesome, it's, it's difficult. Um, when we looked at, uh, number one, uh, what's useful for faculty to improve teaching practice, I think there was a very good suggestion in terms of leadership being engaged in real-time uh, effort and interest, maybe coming to classes, being visible in the many teaching fora that exist, um, in some ways to start to shake it up a little bit um, and help everyone you know, uh, shift their attention. Um, in terms of challenges, obstacles among many, uh, we came to the broader piece of making the case for change, engaging stakeholders. Certainly incentives comes up right away, but also thinking about the many metrics that we lean on and their weaknesses. I know it was mentioned in terms of um, ratings and you had scores and things in terms of uh, for classes or courses that we know are weak metrics, yet somehow they still live with us. Um, and so how we address that, I think, is, is a big issue. And that came up for us many times. Um, item three, promising practices. I, we each came up with examples and ideas in terms of engaging faculty and developing the solutions, the programs, the practices that then are going to affect them as end users. So that, again, they're part of the process. Um, and then uh, number four, in terms of supporting, at the department versus school versus university level, certainly it can happen in many levels, but the, uh, the, the feeling of this group was generally that the department level is part of the core of where it needs to start because there are so many differences. And it's not to have them live as separate silos, but then deciding how they link may be yet another piece of the process we've as yet to learn. Did I leave anything out? No? Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, Rich, did you have anything well, to add on these? So I, um, I have a couple of questions. How many people here are on the ladder track? Oh, wow, interesting. Uh, so relatively few. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, we talked about our metrics. That was obviously one of the uh, themes that I heard listening in and, and some of the report out. Uh, you know, at one level, attendance, I think, is a universal problem in a lot of courses, right? And faculty get upset, people aren't coming, right? There's something wrong with the students. But in terms of demonstrating there's a problem, I'd say, you know, if they, were coming, if they felt there was value added, they would show up, right? That's, I'm a big value added person. That people make decisions on whether between this and this, I can do two things, which one's adding value to what? My goals are right. If it's not adding value, they don't show up unless it's mandatory and there's a penalty for it. So that to me is almost our biggest metric that there's a problem at some level. Uh, and uh, and then I guess the other question I have, and to talk so two other things. One is the, the culture is huge, right? And everybody talked about the culture. And all I would argue is don't be afraid to start. And I put that slide up. that seven years ago is when we had a 
a major symposium at the med school to start talking about peer observation. Seven years later, we're implementing it. We got 40 faculty in the pre clerkship. You know, it takes time. But you, you know, we had more fat people with tenure, and it would probably be easier to say that. But, but it, you know, it takes time to, to get some of these changes into place. And the one thing that we play with a little bit in med school, and some medical schools across the country have it, I don't know whether it ever would fly in the university level, is a department of education. You know, so you have your, your basic department that you're in, content sort of department, but then for people who are really making a career as educators, there's a dual appointment in a department of education within the university, say. And, and so it's another way of recognizing people, incentivizing them, and there may be some ways of getting you know, promotions and other things through that uh, in the Department of Education. But I just throw that as a, as a big picture solution that, of course, would be many years in the, in the <coughs> making, but, but there are some models for that, that sort of notion. You already have a school, right? <laughs> yeah, no, which is, different, which is different than a Department of Education, right? Yeah. It's different, a little bit different. I wanted to add something about the culture. I mean, actually, the next phase of the study among some of the subgroups or universities is is really to try to do a longitudinal survey, a study about really evaluating what the culture is for teaching at a particular uh, institution, and then cross correlating that with with really what it is, what is the emerging trend is, and and so. Um, actually, if anybody is interested in any of these uh, next phases, you know, do do get in contact with me. Thank you, uh, Julia, thank you, Rich, thank you, Barbara. Um, if you could just go ahead and make yourself take one minute and write on a card one thing, it doesn't have to be based just on this session, but from today, that you would like to do to change your practice. Could be a long-term thing, could be right now, could be from any point of view, but one thing that you think you would like to do to improve teaching and learning practice. And I, I say this like we're all ready to go have lunch. <laughs> but consolidating and forcing yourself to commit to something that you think you might want to do will actually make it more likely that people will go out and do things and, and improve things. And, and one final um, sort of observation. Um, <coughs> Peter, who's sitting here, we had a conversation uh, last week a faculty member deeply involved with the School of Public Health and in, in, um, a number of educational initiatives, but he's leaving Harvard to go be a dean at another institution. So here he is taking careful notes, because now he's going to be a dean. He's got the responsibility of trying to think about. So you, you just, you never know where these ideas that might get reported out could actually go, how many uh, students could be affected uh, on the West Coast instead of on um, one minute to just write something down. Thank you all.